In this lesson, I'm going to try and combine three things that are a little dull and pretty procedural, at least in the high school level. So we're going to combine the Pythagorean theorem, real numbers, and writing math in English and taking things written in English and translating them into math. We're going to do it all right here together in this one lesson. Oh, Lord. i got to warn you, at least one thing isn't true, and... One thing I say in here will hopefully explain a pop cultural reference that you might not understand. When I say one thing's not true, the math is all good. There's something else that might be false. So let's get started. This dude right here, well, this is Pythagoras. He's known for the Pythagorean theorem. He's been dead a really long time. Even his dust has died. Uh, Pythagoras was wicked smart. I mean, smarter than that dude in uh, Goodwill Hunting. He was so smart, they made up a new word to describe how smart he was. Philosopher. Philosopher is a compound word, philo and sophie. Well, philo is love, sophie is knowledge, so yeah, I think a philosopher would be somebody that loves knowledge. Sorry, Matt Damon, covering up your face there. Uh, one day, Pythagoras got bored. He decided to go from Greece, well, what we call Greece, to what we call now India. And when he was there, um, man, he had a great old time. He did pick up a lot of their religious ideas and their cultural practices, and he probably actually learned the Pythagorean theorem there in India, but he took credit for it. When he returned home, he wanted to apply some of the things he learned, and he started a religious movement. He kind of went Jim Jones with it. Now, if you don't know who Jim Jones is, during the 60s and 70s, he, he started a cult. People would give him all of their money and possessions, leave their families, friends, and jobs, and go live with him. He even made a little a little town in Guyana and a whole bunch of people followed him over there because well he was a super convincing speaker and he convinced people that he knew what caused anxiety and if they came to live with him things would be great problem was he started getting a little paranoid and afraid he was gonna lose them all so he made poison kool-aid with he poisoned it with cyanide and he had the parents give it to the children and then take it themselves 909 people died but that's where the phrase, did you drink the Kool-Aid, came from. Pythagoras wasn't quite that bad. Here's the thing with uh, Pythagoras. He had some rules and you had to live by them. The first rule was, all things are number. Number two, can't harm insects. Remember, he went to India and reincarnation, big deal. So if you kill this grasshopper right here, you might have just killed Nana. No eating meat allowed for the same reason as number two. Uh, number four, clothing, completely optional. And number five shows me how smart Pythagoras really was. When you consider rule number four, hmm, with rule number five together, good idea. Pythagoras said everything was a number, and what he meant was that because we can understand numbers, and we can apply numbers to real-world situations, and we can ever understand everything about the numbers, we can also understand everything about real-world situations, like why my wife says I'm not mad when she really is. What about numbers? So the numbers that, that Pythagoras had actually is what caused him to have some trouble. He did have the natural numbers, which kind of like caveman numbers. They start with one, two, three, four, just counting numbers. Like if you had Jimbo the firecracker daredevil and he wanted to count how many fingers he had left, it would be a natural number. Unless he did five too many tricks, then he'd have no fingers. That would take him from the natural numbers to the whole numbers. The whole numbers are the natural numbers and zero. Then, after that, you have the integers. The integers are the whole numbers and their opposites. There isn't an opposite of zero, it's just zero, but there's an opposite of one, it's negative one. There's an opposite of 27, it's negative 27. That would make up the integers. In between those numbers, because, well, we're talking about what's going to be a number line, there's big gaps between negative one and zero and zero and one. In between there, there are rational numbers, fractions and decimals, right? Like one-half, three-fourths, one-fourth, all those things, right? And then, of course, the decimals, 0.3 repeating, which is turns out to be one-third, right? So the rational numbers are in between those whole numbers and integers. By the way, all of these whole numbers are also rational because they can be written as a fraction. Two over one, hmm, there's a ratio. Any number that can be written as a ratio of two integers is rational. This is where the trouble began, because Pythagoras didn't believe that what we know now are called irrational numbers existed. 
And what you're going to see in this class in the very near future, irrational numbers still cause us trouble today. They are confusing and they are tricky. Let's see how this came to be, where these came from, and how it caused problems. So suppose there's this little girl on the beach playing around, and Pythagoras walks up and is like, hey, what you doing? And she says, well, I'm stuck. You see, Mr. Pythagoras, I know that this is how it works. I know a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And I know that the sum of the squares of the short side, by the way, sum is add, squares of the short side would be these, right? a squared and b squared, squares of the short sides, is the same as, which would be equals, the square of the long side. So this sentence here is the same as the equation. The sum of the squares of the short side is the same as the square of the long side. And by square, we actually literally mean square. I'll show you that right here. So the little girl, she would say to Pythagoras, look, if I have a triangle, and this side's three, and this side is four, and it's a right triangle, right? which this little symbol here for us would mean right triangle, then I would know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared is true. And so then if this side was three, the square that I made from that side would be nine. Like I would literally take this side and copy it over here and make a square. All sides are the same, area is nine. If I did the same thing on the side of four, the area would be 16. Well, 16 plus nine is 25. So the long side would have a square that have an area of 25. And I know that there is a number times itself that equals 25. This would have to be 5, because 5 times 5 is 25. The area of this square would be 25. Mr. Pythagoras is like, yeah, you're a smart kid, so what's the problem? And the little girl explains, well, what if I have a triangle like this? Each side is 1. Well, that makes this area 1, and this area 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. Huh. But you told me everything's a number, and there isn't a number times itself that equals 2. Mr. Pythagoras would be like, hmm, dang, you're a really smart kid. Because you see, this is actually exactly what would cause trouble. Because the number times itself that equals 2, we know now is irrational. But they didn't have that back then. He thought that that wasn't a number. So what Pythagoras would do is he would take him out to the Mediterranean Sea and have him swim with the fishes. Pythagoras had trouble with the irrational numbers. So the irrational numbers actually take our set of numbers and makes it a true line. It fills in all the gaps. You see, there's infinitely not many numbers in between uh, 0 and 1. There's infinitely many uh, rational numbers between 0 and 1. In fact, even between 0 and 1 quarter, there's, there are infinitely many rational numbers. We could just keep zooming in over and over and over again. What actually fills the gaps and makes this a solid line are the irrational numbers. And again, irrational numbers are square roots of prime numbers and transcendental numbers like pi. All right, so how could someone so smart like Pythagoras be so dumb? Well, turns out he wasn't dumb. Not at all. The guy was brilliant. It took over 1,500 years for someone to really explain what irrational numbers were and make sense of it. That's one of the cool things about education. We can take all of the previous and past learnings and condense them and, and learn them without having to discover everything. And then we can work on the solving the problems that are presented to us today. I hope that today you've learned the difference between rational and irrational numbers. Hope you learned all these things. There's some practice problems on my website thebeardedmathman.com. And in the video's description, I'll post a, a link that you can go directly to those practice problems. I hope you found this video entertaining and informative. If you learned something and you like this video, you could really help encourage me to make more videos by just clicking like and sharing the video. Um, tell people about it. Subscribe to my channel and maybe even visit my website, thebeardedmathman.com. Thanks again.